Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Knicks Film School podcast. My name is Andrew Claudio, a.k.a. GMAC, and it's time for another Knicks Film School pod of the evergreen variety. This one will probably not talk about the Knicks very much, but is one is an episode I have been looking forward to since the idea was floated out when this gentleman joined me for a Patreon podcast during the playoffs. I'm, of course, talking about Mr. XJ. First of all, I'll introduce him. XJ, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I am doing great. I mean, you're about to share what this topic's going to be, so I'm not going to spoil it. But I'll just say when we talked about it on the Patreon pod that one time I was a kid in a candy store, I was very excited. When you get the bat signal from GMAC to talk about this specific topic and you're me, <laughs> you can't get happier than that. So, yeah. So we've this is actually a perfect lead up because I I think we've we've hyped up what the idea is and I'm sure by the episode description and the title that you're enticed by what it technically is we're going to talk about and I think it's no surprise to anybody that's gotten to know you over the past year how much you lean on the data side and the advanced impact metrics in your analysis and I was curious based on history who you might actually think should have been rewarded uh, the certain awards that the ML that that uh, and the NBA has given out over the years. And the the funny thing about this season is you also I, if, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it feels like this is also your first introduction to it's not just the data that people use <laughs> in their award voting and that the humans that actually put thought into these awards lean more toward where I am and look at the narrative and the overall story. And while you could make the argument that Embiid should never win MVP and should have never won MVP, the thought was, listen, it's close enough. It's better if over these this three-year stretch, Jokic wins two, Embiid wins one. Like, let's just give one to Embiid because history would reflect better that he won an MVP. And to the cold, calculated data person, that's ludicrous. I again don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think I know you well enough that that is the correct thing that you believe from this past season. Is you I could cover it well. Put those words in my mouth uh, okay. 100%. Yeah, I, I that, so I won't say it's the first time I was introduced to the idea that the voters aren't like data focused mm-hmm. and data driven. Um I was always aware of that, but it was the first time I was so invested in an MVP race and to be quite frank, a six man of the year race um, that suffered from the same kind of casualty where, you know, I'm looking at the data. I'm like, this is very, very clear. They can't possibly do this. Can they? And then they do it. Uh, And then we see Jokic not win his MVP and then prove in the playoffs that clearly he's the best player in the NBA by far. Um, You know, it's just, it's just glaring. And you know, maybe we see a couple more glaring instances as we go through uh, the the last uh, several years in NBA history of the MVP voting. So, yeah. So what we're going to do over the course of two episodes, the first one that you're about to hear is obviously going to be on this feed. The second episode will air on our Patreon podcast. So if you want to get the full 21 year stretch of MVPs that we're going to look at and decide who's the real MVP, uh, over this stretch, uh, just sign up for our Patreon as low as seven bucks a month gets you an extra KFS pod per week. So the first episode airing today um, is the obviously the episode you're hearing now. And the second one, the second part will air tomorrow. So Saturday morning, if you want to check that out. And I got to say, my my analysis has gotten better over the years. But going back and looking through this 20 three year stretch of MVPs, um, which we're only, we're not doing the last two because we argued enough about the 2023 MVP. And I've got to be honest, I argued enough last year about the 2022 MVP. Uh, but I, there are arguments over the years that I was, I was brought back to, you know, XJ, where the, like, especially in the early 2000s that I, I remember arguing for Kobe in 06. I remember arguing for Dirk in 05, I believe it was 05 or 04. Um, yeah, there's 
This award has been argued a bunch over the years. And I'm curious if in the advanced metrics community where it's like usually clear who the top dog is, if there are ever any arguments like that. Yeah, there are arguments all throughout. I mean, we'll probably talk about some. Um, I think it's been more of a clear cut case, at least in recent history from the advanced metrics perspective. Uh, but, you know, I, I just want to clarify, I think, something that tends to be a misnomer, which is that the advanced metrics community doesn't use eye tests, doesn't care about context. Those things are not true at all. Like the point is that you are data driven, not data independent, right? So it's not, mm. we're not just looking at the data and saying, this guy's the MVP. It doesn't matter. The context doesn't matter. Um, what we watched in the season doesn't matter. Intangibles don't matter. Um, all of those things are relevant. And are things that, you know, really good folks who look at the advanced uh, metrics and come up with a lot of this data, um, they consider. And so I consider that stuff as well. And, you know, because of those things, we'll see some instances where the data is very, very close. And then some intangibles will kind of take you over the edge one way or another. So there's definitely some of those cases where it's a, you know, a tough argument. Um, when we get to the kind of earliest 2000s, that time that you're talking about, it gets a little dicey for a few reasons that we'll cover. But um, you know, I think we'll see a lot more. Uh, I don't want to say wrong decisions, but mm. decisions that aren't necessarily agreed with by the data um, as we get kind of like further and further into history. So. Let's break this down. What we're going to do for this episode is go back to 2014. And we're going to start with the year 2020. So honestly, right up until the pandemic. Um, and we'll do the first seven years on this show. And then on the Patreon, we'll do the remaining 13, um, which as XJ said, there's just not as much data to cover. But we'll be able to still have a good conversation about it. But we're going to go year by year and look at what the top five MVP looked like and then decide was the real MVP awarded that season. And the last thing I'll say in the, in the warm up and the lead up to this, I know it, that you hate it or probably hate it that Jokic didn't win MVP and then had to prove it in the playoffs. It's the narrative I live for. There's so many <laughs> examples, XJ, of disrespect during the regular season only to like go and take your crown and and make it undisputable in the indisputable in undisputed. No, I was right the first time um, in the postseason, and that's where if we were to go back even further in history, like Michael Jordan has like multiple of these where it's like dethroning MVPs in the finals was his specialty. So um, I, I'm curious to see where this goes. And I'm, I'm actually very. It's what makes me so impressed by Jokic even more, even though I thought he should have won the first two. And apparently since I picked Embiid for the third one, I hate him now. Um, why I, do you hate Jokic? Why do I hate Jokic for putting him second in MVP this year? <laughs> um, so let's go back to the year before Nikola Jokic's first MVP and start with the 2019-2020 MVP. This is obviously only around a 70 ish game season that was shortened by the pandemic and then finished off in the bubble. First place was Giannis and Tedekumpo uh, with 962 total points. I shouldn't, I'm not going to read all of the voting totals, but he had 85 first place votes. LeBron James came in second, playing for the Lakers that year, um, finished with 16 first place votes. And then sec third, fourth, and fifth was James Harden, Luka Doncic, and Kawhi Leonard. Uh, XJ, who was the real MVP this season? I love that. I love that you're calling it the real MVP. It's it's like you, you pulled it out of my mind because I do want to set this up first by saying I am calling this MVP list the uh, the ranked with evidence from advanced data leaderboard MVP, mm -hmm. aka the R E A L yeah. MVP, <laughs> henceforth known as the real MVP. <laughs> so I love that you've been calling it the right title. Um, well done. We are going through the real MVP list for the 2019-2020 season. The real MVP, Giannis Antetokounmpo. So they got uh, it right this year. They got it right this year. Um, you know, I, Harden was actually a very close second. Uh, even though LeBron came in second in terms of the voting. Harden played, I think I'm looking at it right now, five more games than Giannis. 
Um, so he led Giannis in wins added in nearly every metric, every advanced metric that is relevant. Um, and that's just, you know, that's the Julius Randle effect of just playing more games than the other guys, right? So Giannis was definitely dominant when he did play on both ends, which which gives him the edge, but you know, Harden played more games. And uh, you know, although Harden had a considerable edge offensively over Giannis and in fact, his only peer offensively that year was Damian Lillard. Um, however, you know, the metrics had Harden as also a competent defensive player, which I know a lot of people would <laughs> would object to. But uh, he was solid on that end. And the metrics do grade, it, grade him out that way. Obviously, Giannis was a two-way monster. The eye test supports it. The metrics support it. In fact, LeBron, you know, one of the best impact metrics that we have. Um, LeBron had Giannis graded as a 9.03, which was the highest LeBron grade in the history of the metric in 2019, mm. 2020. I will say different metrics have um, kind of air towards different playing styles. So LeBron really loves Giannis's playing style. That sentence sounds funny. The LeBron metrics. It's what's so really amazing loves, about this yeah. argument you're making is like, oh, this they named a stat after the second place guy. <laughs> and it says yeah. the second place guy shouldn't have finished in second place. You know, as we get earlier into uh, or, you know, back into the past a little more, LeBron will dominate LeBron and oh, dominate across all the other metrics. <laughs> <laughs> so it will happen. But um, uh, yeah, in 1920, uh, LeBron loves Giannis and um, Giannis just had an absolutely dominant year. Again, you know, the games play difference is a bit of a factor. Five games is not enough to make up the amount that Le uh, Giannis dominated on both ends. And uh, yeah, I, I will just say uh, my last comment about that year is really that, you know, Braun was easily behind Harden in almost every metric including my personal metric that weights and aggregates the the main ones. And, and maybe we should highlight that really quick. Like what I base my opinion on through at least 2014 are a combination of primarily the advanced, uh, the impact metrics, EPM and LeBron with consideration that I also give to Raptor from 538 real plus minus from ESPN and box plus minus, which I wouldn't say it's like an impact metric. It primarily focuses on box score data. Um, but box plus minus or BPM is going to be really important to us as we get to the time before 2014 when some of the player tracking data wasn't available. So we're going to rely on BPM more as uh, you know as time goes on. But those are the metrics that I really cared about and that you know waited for this conversation. So like I said, real real MVP in 2019-2020 is Giannis. <clears throat> Harden is the appropriate second place choice. LeBron, the appropriate third place choice. So to bring everybody back to the 2019-20 season, um, this was Anthony Davis's first year in LA. The Lakers at the time of the pandemic had just had a weekend in which on Friday they beat the they didn't beat the Clippers yet. That that was a big thing. They hadn't beaten the Clippers yet. And they waited until the bubble until they finally beat the Clippers. Or it might have been that they finally beat them right before in that weekend. I remember they had a big weekend in which they beat two title contenders. And it was like clear LeBron was the best player on the floor. And while those moments don't override the overall sample of an 82-game season, it also should be clear who LeBron's second best player was on that team that was carrying a lot of the workload on the defensive end in Anthony Davis. Um, I remember walking away from that weekend and saying, oh, the Lakers are probably going to win the title and LeBron's probably going to win his sixth MVP or his fifth MVP. And then like four days later, Rudy Gobert touched the microphone and then the world stopped and the sports world at least stopped. And then we were all inside for a year and a half. Um, point being, I remember the narrative around LeBron James. He switched to point LeBron, um, led the league in assists that year, averaged 25, 8, and 10 over that season while shooting at 50% uh, from the field. Um, to the hardened point of it all, I averaged 34 points a game, and it was like, it wasn't super efficient, but on the volume he was shooting, I think you could argue it actually was pretty efficient. Uh, 34, 7, and 8 were his splits that year. So these were the clear three for me 
Uh, I'm not, I'm not surprised because I, I know what the advanced metrics say about Harden and, and the impact that his rebounding and his assist totals matched with the fact that he was like leading the league in scoring, like Kobe leading the league in scoring mm-hmm. over this stretch. That I'm not surprised. And yeah, the the more you look into the the Bron Laker era, and you just see how important Anthony Davis has been to their actual success. Whereas LeBron may be the engine, um, Anthony Davis might be the the brick and mortar of the entire train that that's actually going. So I I I think they go hand in hand perfectly. Um, so yeah, I'm not. Do you want to finish out a top five for the MVP? Um, I didn't do a top five for every year. I did just did a top three, but I, I will say to your point about efficiency, it's like interesting because the in you know kind of the advanced metrics community, we really rely on true shooting to indicate efficiency. And in that year, uh, James Harden had a higher true shooting than both Giannis and LeBron, and that's where the free throw shooting comes into play. And that's where yeah. the free throw, and that's where getting to the line a million times and shooting eighty-seven uh, percent or whatever he shot that year, that's where that just tilts the balance in his favor so much. And that's and, and honestly, it's a good precursor to conversations that are coming up about James Harden, where the advanced metrics and impact metrics really love James Harden based well, on that so free throw shooting. <laughs> the tough part about his free throw shooting, and this is where the human element comes in is the way he was getting to the lines. The, the, I'm just going to call it the flopping he was doing where you have no intention of shooting a shot. You're just trying to draw contact on this, which to the human voter is like, I get it. It, it works and you can't fault the guy for doing something that works. We watched Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle do it in, in amazingly this season. It's why I'm not going to hold it against James Harden to an extent. Um, but it's also, I think, why his career has gone a certain way in the playoffs when the whistles get tighter and they don't reward you as much. Yes. Where you're, de- you're so much of your game is dependent on an extra six to eight free throws that are coming from your ability to draw fouls and you're not getting those foul calls in the postseason. And I think the human voter did not want to reward that, <laughs> that season, at least that season in particular, he, the guy is like, I think six top three MVP finishes. So it's what adds to his, his legacy in the regular totally. season for, for how great he is. And it's the ability to draw fouls during the playoffs. Absolutely. So, uh, during the regular say- season, I should say. And I will say, uh, you know, the data, the data does not care about play style. Oh, no, it doesn't. How, no, no, yeah. I, I, I just, I agree with you. So I don't even, li- I don't personally don't like James Harden's style. There was one season we'll talk about where he was in the MVP conversation. Maybe he didn't win it. Maybe he should have won it, but I was not rooting for him to win it because mm. I did not like that play style at all. And it's just funny. We talk about guys like Curry changing the game and, and other, other guys like that. James Harden changed the game by introducing all types of ways to draw fouls mm-hmm. that didn't exist before. The rip through, the the you know sticking the arms out in the lane, and he introduced a lot of things that guys do now every day um, that weren't happening before him. So you know, Harden changed the game, maybe for, for not for the best, but it's why so many people. And we'll move on to the next year after this, but so many people have pointed to RJ as like, he needs to spend a summer with Jimmy Butler because that's the way. And Jimmy Butler is plenty of foul baiting, don't get me wrong. But specifically from a left-handed perspective, the summer he should spend a player with, the player he should spend a summer with is James Harden. And Absolutely. Just teach me, teach me your ways, Obi-Wan. <laughs> like, literally. Okay. We go to 2018-19 where Giannis Antetokounmpo won his first MVP over the man of the hour, James Harden. Uh, Giannis had 78 first place votes. Harden had 23 first place votes. Third, fourth, and fifth, Paul George, Nicole Jokic, and Steph Curry. Giannis this year um, averaged 20, Jesus, 28, 13, and six, along with a block and almost two steals. Shot 58% from the field, although only 73% from the line. Uh, James Harden this year, Average 36 a game <laughs> along with seven rebounds and eight assists. I'm rounding up on all these numbers, by the way. Uh, 44% from the field, from the field, uh, 37% from three, 88% from the free throw line. Um, I remember the Simmons Rosillo pods about this being like, Harden's going to 
he's going to have an MVP. Se- he's going to have an MVP caliber season with like most of his points coming from the free throw line with that's how effective he was at getting to the line. Um, XJ, for the 2018-19 season, who was the real MVP? The real MVP in 2018-2019, James Harden. I figured. Highway robbery mm. that James Harden did not win this MVP award. It is Harden, easily. Um, Harden dominated in every wins added metric. Uh, in fact, in his 2019 season, had the greatest number of EPM wins added in any season where they were able to incorporate um, solid player tracking data with 25.5. That is an amazing feat considering one of the seasons we're going to talk about sometime soon. The fact that that is the greatest wins added season in the history of the metric to this point is unbelievable. And uh, for reference... Harden's wins added met, um, in EPM in that year was 25.5. Giannis's was 16.3. Mm-hmm. The gap Which is, is still ridiculous. a good number, by the it's way. An it's still like a number. really good number. That's yeah. an amazing number. It, 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 it's not necessarily MVP caliber in most seasons, to be honest. Even in an average season, it's not really MVP caliber. It's like close. Um, but 25.5 is all time great. Uh, and this was just Harden's masterpiece offensive season. He had an 8.2 offensive EPM. For, for context, Jokic's highest single season offensive EPM is 7.7. That's Nikola Jokic's highest offensive EPM season is 7.7. Harden had an 8.2. And even looking at the traditional counting stats, like you said, an insane 36 yeah, points Yeah, it's average 36 a game. Yeah. 36, 7, and 8, and 2 steals. Like... <laughs> I, I've i never been a Harden fan, so I remember kind of wanting Giannis to take it, but I know he didn't deserve it. Um, Harden was definitely the real MVP and just got robbed that year. There's no way about There's no way around it. So I want to say voter fatigue, but the year before he wins it, and that even was a lot of people thought that was a LeBron's MVP that he stole. Um, so then the following year, on so much volume and so many free throws, uh, I think they were ready to coronate somebody else is my thought as far as the voting is concerned. Um, I'm actually glad this exercise exists, X Shay, that you and I are doing this <laughs> because I've been doing these um I've been doing some Patreons lately with John and we've been slandering the name of one, James Harden. Uh, you're gonna get upcoming. love today. <laughs> I I'm glad I can finally like actually give him some flowers. So I have the date here. It was November 28th of this season. The Rockets dropped to 9 and 11. And I believe it actually got worse than that. No, that's it's that point. They were 9 and 11 and people were like Chris Paul was in and out of the lineup. And this is the year after they won 65 games and he won the MVP and then the playoffs happened. Um and it was very much like okay, like what's going to happen with this Rockets team? Are they now a five seed? And he just turned it on from that point going forward um, to the tune over the next 56 games of, I have it here, 39 points a game over 56 games, 39, 38.5 to be specific, uh, seven and seven. So he was averaging 39, <laughs> seven and seven over 56. That's ridiculous. Games. Like on like very good efficiency. He goes getting to the line 11 times a game and shooting it 89%. So 10 of those points each game were coming from the free throw line. You could argue 11 points a game because it was 10.4 free throws a game. He was taking 14 threes and making uh 37% of them. So like, this is the this is the time when I actually would be like, oh, James Harden is on, and I'm gonna hate eleven of these points. But the way he's able to just pull up from anywhere, there's a game against the Warriors that was on TNT this season that was part of their season turnaround. Because this team won 54 games, he took that team that was nine and eleven at a certain point and just turned them into a juggernaut that was trending toward a two or a three seed the rest of the season. Um, there was a game against Golden State. I have it here. It was January 3rd where Harden had 44 points on 44 points on 32 shots, 10 of 23 from the line. And the entire stat line is 44, 10 rebounds, 15 assists. And he hit a three to put the 
the Rockets up by one with like four seconds left with Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, and Steph Curry rotating over to try and <laughs> stop him. And while there probably wasn't like an open man, he was like, no, I'm taking this. And that's the type of MVP shit that I appreciated. Yep. This in doing the research with you overnight was like, okay, this probably should have been Harden's MVP. I I was under I, I remember the conversation around what Giannis was doing in the East and like it should not be sneezed at him averaging 27 and 13. No. Um, yeah, but I recognize what Harden was doing was outstanding, especially that 56 game stretch. I love, you know, I just want to say I love doing this with you specifically, mm-hmm. DMAC, just to bring all of the context. For those who don't know, Andrew has an absolute encyclopedic memory of Shout all out sports. Immaculate Grid. Yes. <laughs> the Immaculate Grid <laughs> King over here. Um, so I love all of the contextual elements and it's bringing back my memory too. I think the thing about it with Harden. So one thing I want to say is that he also did play six more games than Giannis. Giannis played 72 games. Harden played 78 games. That really matters to me and and in terms of overall impact. Um, But the thing about Harden is we talk a lot about the foul baiting and the foul drawing. The fact is that Harden will hit insanely difficult threes. And in that season, he was hitting really tough threes, almost all off the dribble to shoot 37% on that kind of volume of off the dribble threes where he's just dancing, just dancing on the perimeter from deep and will hit threes at a 37% clip. It, it it's it, that to me, that season is a historic season. And I think that may be one of the most egregious robberies that we'll see moving forward in history. Well, let's see if they get even more egregious. The 2017, 2018 MVP was awarded James Harden. Uh, in that season, he had, excuse me, 86 first place votes. Uh, LeBron James came in second, his final season in Cleveland with fir- with 15 second pl- uh, first place votes, finished in second. Anthony Davis then finished third. Damian Lillard finished fourth. And Russell Westbrook for the second year in a row, averaging a triple double, finished in fifth. Uh, soon to be MVP winner with a measly 27 and 10 and 5. Uh, that season. I remember the biggest takeaway from watching this NBA season in particular, XJ was like, oh, so everybody's just going nuts. Like, I know we just had like a nuts statistical season where everybody was scoring a ton. Yeah. This, this was, I think the rise of that because we were just getting smarter and shot selection and yep. we were gravitating more toward the, the math of it all. And this was, I thought that the beginning of that, this is, this was the warrior's effect, if you want to call it that. Um, but James Harden wins his first MVP on a 65 win uh, Houston Rockets team that eventually loses in the conference finals to the Golden State Warriors. Uh, James Harden this season averaged 30.4 points per game, five rebounds, nine assists on 45, 37, 86 splits. Um, XJ, who was the real MVP this season? 2017, 2018 season, the real MVP was James Harden. James um, Harden. Harden rightfully won, uh, beating out LeBron. To be honest, this one was only close. It was close, but only close because LeBron played 10 more games than Harden. And that's a ton. Like, played I played 82. Yeah, he played, he all, played 82. all 82. <laughs> you got to give him credit for that. He played all 82. And in terms of like a per play or per game impact, Harden. <laughs> kind of trounced LeBron in that case. Um, but LeBron played 10 more games and and maintained that high level of play across those additional 10 games. So that really matters. But um, Harden took the crown in EPM, LeBron, Raptor, um, which Raptor loves Harden. Like LeBron loves Giannis, Raptor loves Harden. <laughs> uh, uh, he also took the crown in RPM and BPM. So he swept every metric on my list. Um, you know, it was a domination from Harden. Braun was close in wins added, but because of the 10, uh, you know, the 10 games played, but, but Harden still swept that category in wins added. So it, it was a clear, you know, c- could have been a, like a unanimous MVP choice in that year. I, it's so much Harden love and I know people aren't going to like it, but the, the data doesn't care about the foul baiting stuff. The data knows that fouls are just the most efficient way to play the game. So uh-huh. if you're getting to the free throw line at the, mo- you know, at a ridiculous clip, you're, you're up there in the league. So, so this is where I now bring the human element in and say, this should have been LeBron's fifth MVP. Okay. Well, I recognize the data doesn't care about how you get your points or how you draw your fouls. 
the human eye hated that shit. Now I do recognize. <laughs> I, I do with you. I do recognize like the narrative of them winning sixty five games is absolutely why. Like okay, now we have to coronate hard, and he's finished second behind all the like multiple years behind uh, these these other guards. This is the this is the year Harden finally wins his, and they were one seed in a season that the Warriors existed, and you know probably as honestly it is his best chance would have been his best chance at the title. Whether you want to blame it on Chris Paul getting hurt in Game Five, whether you want to blame it on him just shooting poorly over the final two games, where a great player player could have been great and thrown the Warriors by himself could have been the play, but. What I remember from that season more than anything else, and it's why if you're going to give the MVP or more specifically, actually, the MVP placement to Harden over LeBron in 2020 because LeBron's best teammate was Anthony Davis. Um, where did Chris Paul finish in EPM this season? Which the season that we're talking about right now? Yeah. Offensive EPM, offensive EPM. Uh, let us see. Oh no, it's actually the same for EPM. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, this is 2018, 2018, right? 2018. Yeah, it was six point. Uh, Chris Paul's was six point seven, so he yep. was fourth. fourth. Yeah. Okay. Find LeBron's closest teammate. <laughs> That's well, my whole argument because the well, LeBron gets yeah. knocked because Anthony Davis was the brick and mortar or the engine or whatever you want to call it for the. Train. That's fair. That's like. Fair. I remember the year after they traded Kyrie and it was like, oh, don't worry. He's got Isaiah Thomas. You finished top five in MVP the year before. And it was no, this isn't a thing. What you have is a Mon Shumpert and J.R. Smith hopefully showing up. Well, Kevin Love, games. Kevin Love. Kevin so Love was I'm getting up. to it. They had okay. Kevin Love there and his yeah. rebounding was impactful. But that team became LeBron and the LeBronettes for <laughs> the majority of that year. It he was played. He played all 82 games. That team was lucky to win 50. And I remember the article coming out during the playoffs of the miles he was running during the season that he just, they couldn't sit him like the minutes he was playing during these games. And it was like, yeah, he's taking like stretches of games off. Like what we saw in that game four against the, the nuggets this year, where he just like needed to recharge his batteries, but did it on the court. He started doing that in 2018 when he was like a 33 year old man at this point. Um, yeah, he was 33. Yeah, 33 year old man at this point. And it was very clear he's going to have to start conserving his energy for these games. And it just, it was fine. The impact he had, the gravity he had of making sure we have to watch LeBron. Um, I, I think this was, this was one of the more impressive old man seasons and dragging that Cavs team to the playoffs as a, four, as a 50 win team. I was impressed with. And then you get to the playoffs. You want to talk about a coronation. His teammate forgot the score in game one against the Warriors. <laughs> and that's the only reason they lost. Like yeah. guy had 51, eight and eight in that game. And it's going to get knocked on. I'm like, Oh, here's a loss in the finals to Steph. And it's like his teammate forgot the score, man. James no, in the playoffs was fourth in EPM. In the playoffs, yeah. In the playoffs, nobody different was story, touching LeBron. Right. That. That's story, a whole yeah. different story. Yeah, yeah. I thought this was as much of Chris Paul's MVP share of it. Like he was so impactful, he got James Harden an MVP award. Whereas LeBron losing Kyrie and them still being a contender in the East was, to me, the narrative that I was leaning toward. I knew Harden was going to win it, though. Like that was the talk. Yeah. Like it was. It wasn't unanimous, but it was pretty close as far as first place votes is concerned. I think that this is a really strong argument. So I, I think this is a really strong argument. Again, these are intangible and contextual factors that need to be considered. I think mm -hmm. the fact that LeBron is playing 82 games and playing 37 minutes a game is, is ridiculous, right? Like, okay, so his impact is not going to be as much as Harden who is having time off, you know, like mm -hmm. literally taking 10 games off and playing fewer minutes. Um, that's an important factor to consider. So I don't, I don't, you know, sniff at that. I don't say that that's not a big deal. I think that that's totally valid. To me, it's just the fact that Harden dominated across the board that it's it's not close enough for that to put it over the edge to me. But I think it's a strong argument. So I, I won't I won't say if if they gave it to LeBron that year, I wouldn't say this was egregious based on that argument that you're making. So now we're going to transition to 
One of the awards I remember not even arguing the most, but it's the one of the first because we had two Steph MVP years that I'm sure that we're going to get through quickly. Um, but then we had this 2017 season that I remember it being so contentious and, and so heavily debated. And it's why, like, I'm glad the advanced metrics showed that it's at least close, you know, that it wasn't as like, a, it wasn't so stupid that we gave Russell Westbrook an MVP on a six seed, you know, that all of us knew was not getting out of the first round of the playoffs, but the narrative around it. So Russell Westbrook wins the MVP, averaging a triple double, setting the record for triple doubles in a season um, that year, uh, passing, uh, passing Oscar Robertson. Um, James Harden finishes second. Um, the first year of Mike D'Antoni averaging 29, 8, and 11. Uh, Kawhi Leonard finishes third on a 67-win Spurs team. Uh, also wins Defensive Player of the Year that year. LeBron James finishes fourth on a Cavs team, gets one first place vote. And then, my goodness, you had to be there to know that this was actually justified. Isaiah Thomas, not the one from the Pistons, the one from the Celtics, finishes fifth in MVP this season. Yeah. Yeah. XJ, I don't know if you I don't know if you remember this season as well as I do. I remember the Isaiah Thomas experience and all of us just kind of shrugging, be like, huh? I guess he's the what is gonna, happening. I mean, first team all NBA this year. <laughs> like in a year, Steph Curry and Russell Westbrook and James Harden all exist. And this guy's making all NBA. Uh, Isaiah Thomas, just real quick, Isaiah Thomas led the league in offensive EPM that year. Mm -hmm. So it was, was potentially uh, and like by far. So. It was genuinely one of the weirdest things because he was doing these, he was having these seasons with Sacramento and with Phoenix and even with Boston in the beginning where it's like, oh, this guy's like a nice little offensive machine. I I don't want to make the comp completely because I think Brunson's better, but there is a hint of like Jalen Brunson to it where yes, he's a, as Mensa calls it, a traffic cone, like being hunted on the defensive end. But man, He's going to score like 40, 50 points on you. He had 57 points in a playoff game. Wow. So I recognize, I, I know we're, I'm spending a lot of time on Isaiah Thomas. Just that's, that's the one where I looked at it in the, um, all, by the way, he made second team, not first team. Um, that's when I looked at it in the, in hindsight, being like, oh, wow, we, that's right. The Isaiah Thomas year is this season. So first, let me ask you history wise, actually, do you know how many MVPs? have been awarded to a player not from a top three seed from not from a top three seed like in the history of the game yes uh i don't know off the top of my head maybe i will say not in a top three seed maybe i'm gonna say four i think yeah i think you nailed it so the tough part about this comp is that or this is question is that the league didn't always have eight playoff teams in each conference um, Jokic did it as a six seed two years ago when um, he did it with the Nuggets the year they got swept by the Warriors in the first round. Um, before that, it was Russ doing it as a six seed for the Oklahoma City Thunder in 2017, this season. Before that, you got to go back to 1982 when Moses Malone did it for a six seed on the then Houston Rockets, which... In the moment, people were like, this is crazy. We got Magic. We got Bird. We got Kareem. And so what happened with Malone on that MVP season where they made the playoffs and lost in the first round um, is that he then went to the Sixers the next season and they won 65 games and went 15 and one in the playoffs and was like, oh, apparently Moses Malone is pretty good <laughs> is the takeaway from this. Um, but I remember it being like, we're really going to give this award to a guy that because the narrative was Durant went to the Warriors, created this unfair thing. And then the entire Oklahoma City Thunder commitment was we're going to make Russell Westbrook the MVP of the league. So I now ask you in their efforts that they 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 did do it. Don't get me wrong. They did get him the MVP of the league for the 2017 season. Who was the real MVP? In the 2016-2017 season, so you're not going to believe this, Mr. Triple Double actually deserved... Oh! His, no, I, I, I'm just kidding. It's not. Okay, no. 
I think I know. Can I guess where you're going with this? Please guess. Please guess. Is it Steph, should he is one of his third? The straight? real MVP is Steph Curry. F- okay. Wow. The real MVP of 2016, 2017 is Steph Curry. And I'm sorry I did the switcheroo with you. It just, I just had to do it because I, it worked. Don't get me wrong. It worked. <laughs> because, and the reason why I think it worked is because Westbrook really did have a great season and really was a legitimate MVP candidate. Like, I would say Westbrook was second in MVP that year. So it's not like it was egregious in terms of he shouldn't have been up there. He really did have an amazingly impactful season, but Curry should have had his third in a row. Curry should have had his third in a row. Um, You know, it's surprising that the voters didn't let a player win three in a row like he deserved. (laughs) Where, Where have we seen that before? You know why he didn't, though. I know why he did it. I know why he didn't, but I'm going to talk about... Okay. So what the, the thing about it is that the impact metrics that I love so much, they are, exist. The, the, the purpose of these metrics is to isolate value independent of teammates and independent of opponents. The purpose is to say, here is what this player is contributing without regard to the, his teammates, how good his teammates are, if he has Kevin Durant, Durant as a teammate, or if the opponents are terrible or the opponents are great. That's what their purpose is. They're not perfect at it, of course, and they're going to continue to be improved. But they're very good at isolating value. And, in, and, and Curry just, just plainly blew Westbrook off the board in EPM, in Raptor, in RPM. He also bested him in LeBron. Westbrook had the edge in box plus minus. But again, that's informed only by the box score data. And if there's anything that triple doubles do... It is fill up your box score. <laughs> um, and, and here's something I, like, I think this is a great point that I want to bring up. Something interesting is about why I and why we talk about impact and why impact is what matters. An awesome note in um, Seth Partnow's uh, book, The Midrange Theory, is that Westbrook's MVP campaign and really his final three years in OKC, he dominated the league in uncontested rebounds. Mm. So over his last three years, on average, about 15% of his rebounds were contested, while the league average was 25%. So essentially, 85% of, the, of his defensive rebounds, anybody on his team could have gotten. It added no value. <laughs> Literally, if there was whoever his backup was, I don't recall the time I had, who he, if he was out there, he would have gotten the rebounds. It, does, it did not matter. Um, and the averaging a triple-double thing, you know, it was like a function of uh, Steven Adams donating dozens of rebounds to Russell Westbrook. What, what, so, what were we, did you? Well, so we first of all, his backup that season was campaign. Campaign. The, I no, I had campaign in my head, but I didn't say it. Now of the, where is he now? He just got traded from the Suns to somebody. He just went somewhere. I was yeah. going to say the Suns, but I don't. This know is this is now. that's a John and Jeremy question. Um, knowing where <laughs> campaign is. Um, yes. <laughs> it's not even so much that Stephen Adams was gifting him because I, I remember the the thing going around Twitter of Adams and Cantor boxing out. And it's like their strategy is to Russ gets every defensive rebound. Every defensive board. Yes. It was it wasn't box out to get the rebound. It was box no. out so Russ can to get allow the Russ to just gently jump, you know, mm-hmm. a, a couple feet off the ground and grab the board. So it's just I you know, that is what I'm talking about about impact. And there's no impact there. You're, he is not contributing impact to the game. It's not like, man, if Russ wasn't there, we would have really been screwed. Like, it's, it's there's no difference whether it's campaign or Russ or whoever on the court. So, you know, and the Curry on the other end, obviously, is adding a ton of impact. If Curry is not on the court, it's a different game. And Durant obviously adds a lot too. But that season wasn't Durant's finest season, to be honest. Um, he only played 62 games. And he 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 had his impact and it was great and, and Curry was surrounded by great teammates. But again, the impact metrics isolate value. Um, but the wild thing is, the wildest thing of all of this to me, GMAC, is that mm-hmm. Curry wasn't in the top five in MVP voting. That's the craziest part, is that he finished sixth. <laughs> is that he Steph finished sixth in MVP voting. Which, again, goes to Kevin Durant went to his team. The, yeah. There was, yeah. Th- look, there's going to be a, a year we talk about in 20, in the neck, in the Patreon version of this, where it's like LeBron's clearly still the best player in the world. We're not giving him the MVP. In fact, he's going to finish third in the MVP, despite still being at the peak of his power, so much so that he's going to win the two MVPs after <laughs> and probably should have won five straight. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's just the breaks of the game. Um, I do want to point out that Russ's clutch numbers this year are off the charts. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. The Warriors, like, the tough part about it is, like, do you give Russ credit for being re- extremely clutch? Or do you give Steph and the Warriors credit for, like, not having many clutch games to play because you're dominating the league for the most part? Um, that was the thing that stood out in the the research for this. Knowing how things were going to go, it's like, oh, Steph probably should have won a third straight. But remembering what I remember that year, it was Russ or there was James no Harden. chance. Yeah, it was no chance. So I got to be honest. Yeah, I stand with Zach Lowe on this. My pick for the MVP this year was Kawhi Leonard um, over everybody else, especially the Defensive Player of the Year award winner mm-hmm. that season. Mm-hmm. Um, what I remember most was. I, and it's mm, it's lost to time because that 2017 Warriors team was dominant and probably the best best talent wise team. Like you basically just upgraded Harrison Barnes to Kevin Durant, which is nuts. <laughs> but like in one of those would have loved to see it series, like would have loved to see it played out. Just they were up by 20 in game one. That Spurs team. Um, I just would have wanted to see what that Spurs team, a healthy Spurs team, because Kawhi gets hurt. Zaza puts his ankle underneath yep. him, yep. misses the rest of the series, and it's a sweep. And it's just like, oh yeah, of course, this is a foregone conclusion. And I would have liked to see what that Spurs team would have done against that Warriors team. Maybe it goes six. Maybe the Warriors just were just that much more overwhelming. But Kawhi this season was very close to a 50-40-90 and was you know, having a Scotty Pippen like defensive season. Yeah, which absolutely. Is what I go to to for that. So um does not shock me because now we're about to have two very quick conversations. Who is the MVP of 2016? Uh the real MVP is Steph Curry. I I this is going to be a quick conversation, but I do want to just, just play this out. Let me just read the I'll, I'll set it up. I'll Please set do. it up. Please do. So Steph Curry this year, the first ever unanimous MVP. Uh, finished ahead of Kawhi Leonard, LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, Kevin Dur- ahead of everybody. Everybody else was second, and that like just the first loser. <laughs> Steph Curry this year, a fifty forty five ninety one season, um, averaged thirty a game with five rebounds, seven assists. Uh, Steph Curry this season. I'm I'm going to the three point attempts because that was the first year where I recognized. Oh, this is a this is a thing that the league's going to start changing as a result. Um, he took 11 threes a game that year and shot 45% <laughs> on those threes. That is absurd. Uh, yeah. He only played 34 minutes per game. So his per 36 he wasn't been playing higher. fourth quarters. Like that's the <laughs> yeah, thing. Exactly. Like the, they were, they, they, the, their rotation dictated that Steph would sit the beginning of the fourth quarter. And if they were up by 15 and Clay got hot, it was like, all right, Steph, sit down. Never we're going to sit you yeah. for the fourth quarter. So there were games where he'd have six made threes through three quarters. And then because the Warriors were so overwhelming, this is the 73 and nine Warriors team of 2016. Um, I already said it. Who's the real MVP? It was Steph Curry this year in one of the more dominating seasons I've ever witnessed. Um, yeah, they were so, I, they were so fun to watch. Before I let you go, so just, fun. Yeah. this was one of the thank God for league pass seasons, like every single time they were on national TV when they were losing, I was excited. Cause like, Oh, how are they know gonna about to happen? Turn this 22 point <laughs> deficit into six in three shots. Like, I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to do it. Um, this, this year, Absolutely. I think gets taken for granted because of how the playoffs went, but this regular season Warriors team was really fun. Go ahead. Talk about Steph Curry. I'm going to talk about Steph Curry. I will say, also, thank God for Kerr's rotations that you mentioned because mm. it, it let you know when you needed to come back to the game. If you were watching something else on mm-hmm. League Pass, it's like, all right, I, I, this is the late third quarter. I can go away for a while. I know when I need yep. to come back because Kerr's coming back in with, uh, you know, the start of the fourth quarter. Um, yes, obviously no real drama here at all. The voters got it completely right. I, I will... I will say if there was any media member who vote, who voted for someone other than Curry, they should have immediately had their vote confiscated. Luckily that did not happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> looking at the impact data, it completely supports at least my eye test, which told me at the time that this was the best and most impactful season I have ever seen in my entire life watching basketball. So in fact, Curry, I'm just looking at the impact data mm-hmm. had the highest ever recorded grades in the player tracking data. 
era in EPM with 10.5, Raptor with 12.5, Raptor War or Wins Above Replacement with 26.7, Real Plus Minus with 11.37, Real Plus Minus Wins with 11.9, and was just shy of the EPM Wins all-time high with 25. Remember, I said James Harden had 25.5 in that MVP season. So, you know... (laughs) He just complete utter domination broke all of these impact metrics, like broke them, like again, highest in all of these different categories. Also had the highest true shoes, true shooting season among any MVP candidate in the group that we're looking at from 2000 to, to 2020 with a true shooting of 67%. Um, <laughs> ridiculous for a guard to shoot, a, to have a true shooting of 67% on the volume that Curry had. Um, obviously, you know, the past two years, Jokic surpassed that true shooting, but you know, different positions and Jokic is a complete beast. By the way, did you know that Jokic had a true shooting of 71% last year while scoring 25 points per game, <laughs> Yeah, which is by five, by far the highest true shooting on not scoring in NBA history. Um, and he didn't win MVP. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I <laughs> digress. Um, Curry, can, can I just pick yeah. back on that for a please, second? Please go ahead. So. Steph shot 64% of his shots at the rim. So that's good for the 82nd percentile that mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. Um, DeAndre Jordan shot 70.9% of his shots at the rim. So nine, which is good for the 98th percentile. And Steph had a higher true shooting percentage. Now, granted, the free throw line is going to have a lot to do with that, but that's how insane his his season was in that. Well, you mean, you mean most, that's the percentage he shot at the rim, right? Yeah. That, that wasn't the percentage of his shots at the rim. That's the percentage he shot at the rim. Oh, it's just literally his field goal percentage. Yeah. His field goal okay. percentage at the rim. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I thought it was going by location. So never mind. The point is, yeah. the, I remember point still the stats stands, was, actually. Yeah. I thought the, the funny part about that season that I remember is there was a stat floating around that he's more efficient from like half court <laughs> than a lot of these centers are from the rim. And it's like, oh, uh, so a Steph Curry half court shot is more efficient. Now, granted, three is <laughs> three is more than two, but still, it's like from forty five feet is ridiculous. more efficient than like Ennis Cantor shooting a layup, you know, or a dunk. Completely, that's, ridiculous. that's how insane this season was. Completely ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, in my opinion, in my opinion, the greatest season in the modern era of the game, including to the current point, including all of Jokic's seasons, all of LeBron's seasons. Um, including all of Jordan's seasons, uh, the greatest offensive season in the history of the game, mm. including Wilt seasons, include like, and the data just plainly completely supports this claim. Like, it's not like I'm saying something that's crazy. Like I'm pulling it out of my butt. Like it, the data supports this. Um, so ridiculous. I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I loved this season too. Um, <laughs> LeBron in 2013 would like a word. Shaq offensively, offensively, this was uh, uh, blew that season away. LeBron in 2013 would like a word. Shaq in 2000 would like a word. Offensively, um, this, uh, this season is better. MJ in 92, 88. Um, like, there's like four Kareem seasons. I like Listen, to throw at you. GMAC, I knew I was coming on with a historian. Well, and so I, I looked at all of those seasons. Uh huh. And this Steph Curry offensive season was better than all because of Because three seasons, is more than two. Season. I get hey, it. I, the reason why is not my... I'm not contesting why. I'm I just get saying it. it is. And the whole league is shooting threes now. I get the impact. I'm not saying it was a bad season. I'm saying that three is more than two. Yes, the math is mathing. But man, there is a historical element that needs to be mentioned. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> my goodness okay i love it <laughs> so 2015 steph also wins the mvp um he finishes this is his first mvp this is the first year of steve kerr um he finishes over james harden who finishes second lebron james finishes third uh in his first season in cleveland russell westbrook finishes fourth anthony davis finishes fifth i should mention kevin durant got hurt this season so russ finished fourth because this is this was i remember the first time people looked at this and was like could he average a triple double for a season and then three years later the 
Oklahoma City Thunder committed to him averaging a triple double team effort. Yeah. Um, Steph Curry had 100 first place votes. James Harden had 25 first place votes. Uh, LeBron James had five first place votes. Steph averaged 24, four and eight this season, 44% from three and about 10 attempts. Um, as well as there's almost the 50, 40, 90. And then the following season, he averaged 50, 45, 90. Uh, but not to be dismissed, James Harden, what we've seen a lot from him, where it's close to a trip, very not close to a triple double, but very good numbers as far as the box score counting stats are concerned, with 37% from three and then 87 from the line. Um, XJ, 2015. I don't think this will be a long conversation. Who was the real MVP? Yeah, not a long conversation. The real MVP in 2015 was Steph Curry. Um, you know, there was no real contest here. He very much deserved his first MVP, gar- carrying the league in every impact metric, BPM, shooting efficiency. Uh, you know, what we really learned from the data is that from 2015 to 2017 was one of the great three year runs in NBA history by a player, by Steph Curry. Um, similar to the 2021 to 2023 stretch that we've seen from Jokic. Uh, something interesting. I mean, I remember this season like very clearly because I remember it was the time when it was like Curry's cooking. Like you got to like put it on ESPN, put it on League Pass. Like, you know, I'm getting texts from friends. I'm texting friends like you got to, you know, the, the Warriors are down 10 in the fourth. Curry's cooking. Put it on the game. Like this was when he started to take the league by storm in that way. Um, you know, I, I, Another interesting note is that the data actually has Chris Paul having a strong case for second above That's what James I was Harden. Going to ask you is is there a case that this should have been Chris Paul's MVP? Which yeah, cr- I yeah. wonder if there's another year that we're going to talk about that could actually dictate that. Very true. Um, Chris Paul did have a case, I will say, um, and it, it was not open and shut. If they would have given it to Chris Paul, it would be tough to say like they really blew it. Um, Chris Paul w- was really strong across the board in all of the metrics. Um, I definitely give Chris Paul second and Harden third. Um, Chris Paul and Harden were comparable offensively, but obviously Chris Paul was a markedly more impactful defensive player. So, it, you know, it's tough, but um, I think it, it was deserved to go to Curry and, and, and Curry was the MVP and the real MVP in 2015. I think looking through the, the research here, and look, Chris, this is a tough season for Chris Paul in the sense that like, he plays all 82 games and then has this first. This is the last year that the NBA didn't just seed the teams one through eight for the playoffs. So first round of the playoffs, Chris Paul and the Clippers are playing Tim Duncan and the reigning champion San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> yeah. And one of the one of the best first round series ever. Yeah, that, that exists. It goes seven games. Paul hits the game winning shot in game seven to dethrone the champions. And then James Harden's waiting for him. And JJ Reddick's talked about this on his pod a ton about that series. Cause he was on the Clippers back then. And he said like, yes, we completely collapsed in game six. I'm acknowledging that when I tell you the entire locker room was just spent by game five, the fact that we had a lead in the fourth quarter of game six was kind of amazing. And yes, we took our foot off the gas. I'm sorry that, that Josh Smith and Jason Terry and Corey Brewer and Dwight Howard beat us. And like Chris Paul has to kind of live with that. The like he that that I thought was his best chance at a ring. The Warriors I was gonna might say have that. needed yep. another year to figure out how to win, but they had James Harden waiting for them, not this 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 Clippers team. But I gotta be honest, the more I hear about hear stories from players on that Clippers team, I think the Warriors also beat them because they would have just Maybe not as battle tested, but just flat out more rested than that Clipper team. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a tough, it's a tough for the overall narrative of Chris Paul that he just, he was outstanding this, this entire season and has an iconic playoff moment. But what's remembered is blowing a 3 1 lead to the Rockets this year. Yeah. And that's really unfortunate because, like you said, uh, I mean, (laughs) Chris Paul is you know as we continue on is going to start getting a lot of love and and to me this was like kind of like the peak chris paul season in terms of his impact in terms of his domination of the game on both ends of the court like he does not get i mean i think he kind of does but sometimes it doesn't seem like he gets enough credit for his defensive impact and that really shone through in this season and that was a great clippers team and and it's really unfortunate that you know the way that things went 
they're not going to get the credit they deserved. I also felt like that was their best chance at a potential title with that squad. Um, but yeah, gassed and a tough matchup in the first round that just really threw everything off. So it's unfortunate. You know, I can imagine a world where Chris Paul wins MVP and the Clippers win the finals in this year, which would be a crazy alternate universe. But alas, it didn't happen. And Curry deserved his MVP. So we get to our last year in this episode. And it's honestly the one that I'm most curious of, of what you're going to say. So Kevin Durant wins his first MVP, his first and only MVP. Um, Russell Westbrook had gotten hurt at a certain point and Kevin Durant turned it on uh, for the rest of the season. Um, averages 32 a game, wins the scoring title, seven rebounds, six assists, shoots nearly 50, 40, 90, 50 point, 50% from the field, 39% from three and 87% from the line. Um, LeBron James finishes second, dethroning a two-time MVP, uh, gets six first place votes. And then it gets a little, little weird. Um, Blake Griffin finishes third in MVP this year. Joe Kim Noah finishes fourth in MVP. This season, shout out Tom Thibodeau and James Harden finishes fifth. Steph and Chris Paul finish respectively sixth and seventh in the voting. Our final one of the episode, XJ, who was the real MVP of the 2013-14 season? The real MVP of the 2013-2014 season was Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant. Um, Wait, Kevin Durant. are you are you baiting me again? Not bait. I wouldn't do You're it twice going with in an Kevin episode. Durant. I, okay, wow. Kevin Durant. Um, yeah, ironically, he was the real MVP. Uh, you know, although very touching, it was not his mom. Um, mm. However, even though you know LeBron finished second, the real competition for Durant was, and we got a theme here, Stephen Curry mm. that year. Um, you know, Curry was already starting to demonstrate ridiculous impact by 2014. He actually beat out Durant and EPM and Raptor and real plus minus. Uh, but Durant dominated in LeBron, which, you know, ar- ironically, again, Le- the LeBron metric loves Durant mm-hmm. and actually had the highest LeBron war in the history of the metric that season, um, uh, which is, oh. is kind of crazy to think about. Um, so it was super close between... Curry and Durant, but uh, I narrowly give it to Durant, who was more efficient, clearly more impactful at the offensive end. Um, Curry, of course, didn't finish in top five in voting. Uh, LeBron, who finished second, definitely deserves to be in the conversation as he almost always does. So it's not like, you know, LeBron shouldn't have been there. LeBron was a clear number three to me. So I would have had it as real MVP Durant, second Curry, third LeBron. Um, Blake Griffin. What? So, man, it was like, a weird time. What, what, yeah. <laughs> what what happened? Like, I, I need to go rewatch this season. Like, he was maybe not a top 30 NBA player in the in this well, in that year, according to about, the data. I don't like, know about all that, but I I, I, do I said remember maybe, not for maybe. sure, but maybe. Like, it's arguable. And the fact that it's, I can argue him as like the 31st best player in the NBA and he won third in MVP, like, what what? What was so, going on that season? I don't understand. I, I think to your point, the the fact that it, he's probably like a top 30 player. Like we'll just say he's 30, right? Sure. And finished third at MVP. That's not the egregious one that I go to. And I don't know if Joe Kim Noah's impact metrics because of how good of a defensive player he was that year, or the impact he had defensively this year um dictates that. But Joe Kim Noah this season <laughs> averaging um averaging 12 11 and 5 one fourth <laughs> for the MVP that year. I remember it. He was he was like it's like if Josh Hart suddenly won fourth in the MVP. <laughs> well, it was the fourth place MVP finish and it's like No, oh, I don't so. think it's like if Josh Hart. I I won't go that far. I so I will. Know, <laughs> Joe Kim Noah say. was an <laughs> Okay. Joe Kim Noah was an excellent rim protector that season. Josh Hart would never protect the rim like Noah Noah did. Um I'm specifically pointing to an impact standpoint that it's like yeah. you're not fearing like, oh, we got yeah. Joe Kim Noah tonight. Oh, we're gonna stop him. <laughs> you know? It's very much the Rudy Gobert argument. And this is this is not to take away from Joe Kim Noah, who was outstanding yeah. on that end of the floor. And mm-hmm. I believe this is this is Two years. So Derek Rose was still getting back his way into because he I, I think he came back this season. I'll look it up now. But like the impact of what the Bulls were that year had a lot to do with 
what Joe Kim Noah was doing. So I understood. Yeah. Rose played 10 games, to be clear. Oh, so this isn't the year he fully came back. It was tw- sorry, 2015 was the year he fully came back um, right. from the injury. So as a result, like they were still able to be in the playoff hunt that year. And it was largely because Joe Kim Noah was having a good, impactful season. Tom Thibodeau also had to pull some strings. Switch. Yeah. I mean, you would have loved it. The the passing that was on that team, we're running it through Joe Kim Noah. Awesome. Uh, I... Joe Kuno wasn't the fourth best player in the league this year. I, I I I want to say I I according to the data, obviously that's what we're 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 kind that's of what we're doing for a lot Go of this ahead. conversation. Let me guess. Noah was not as egregious as Blake Griffin. Noah was had a really? much better season than Blake okay. Griffin did. Um, his defensive impact that season was off the charts. Like you mentioned, Rudy Gobert, like Rudy Gobert level, like obviously through different through a different means, but um. Rudy Gobert level, like uh, his defensive EPM was plus 3.6. That is off the charts. 98th percentile, definitely number one amongst starters and guys who played anywhere near as many minutes as he did. Like there was no one who was close to him um, on defensive EPM besides surprise Jimmy Butler, who was also on that Chicago Bulls, uh, Tom Thibodeau team, uh, and also had a plus 3.1 defensive EPM. So the defense was insane in Chicago. And I I think that that's fair to have. I don't, I think it's fair to reward that level of defense, um, that level of defense to be kind of like top five at MVP voting. It feels like a little bit of a stretch, but I don't think it's crazy. What I think it's crazy is Blake Griffin being in the top three. (laughs) That's what I think is crazy. (laughs) <laughs> Listen, I don't think either of them should be there. If we just agree that both of them shouldn't, I'm fine. Sure, we sure. Put put Steph and Chris Paul in the top five, and you have a very clean top yes. five. I'm honestly stunned that you didn't. I thought you were going to go with Chris Paul. Chris Paul played 62 game. games is the so problem. So that's the, the difference is that over yeah. a 62 game sample, Chris Paul yes. led the league in EPM. And then and, and he led in a lot of other categories as well. So, so Chris Paul in a per minute per game basis would have likely been the MVP. He missed too many games to like he missed 20 games. Um and you can't play like three quarters of the season and be the MVP, especially when guys are playing um Durant played 81 games and also played 39 minutes per game. Yeah. Um versus Chris Paul playing 62 and 35 minutes per game. It's it's just too many. It's too much time where he's off the court. Some of your argument with LeBron, you know, in that one season where he's playing so many minutes, he's carrying his team, he's doing it day in and day out um, and maintaining such a high level. That's what that's what Durant did. So I, I can't put Chris Paul there in a permanent basis. Yeah, I would say Chris Paul was was pretty easily the the, the most valuable, but it's just you can't miss 20 games when other guys are playing 81 and 39 minutes a game and still having a tremendous impact. I wouldn't have Chris Paul there. I would have him in the top three in voting. I would have him third, likely um, third or fourth. Probably uh, it's, it's a conversation between Curry, LeBron, um, Durant and Chris Paul. But I would probably have it Durant, Curry, LeBron, um, CP3. Joe Kim not Noah's, Blake Griffin. Joe Kim Noah's usage this season was... Was thirteen. <laughs> he took ten shots a game, and he went fourth in MVP. He finished fourth in the MVP voting. I get it. There are other things he did. That's why I went to the Josh Hart comp of like, yeah, a guy yeah. you're never gonna put on the draw on the chalkboard before a game or the white. I hear you before a game. And yeah. be like, we have to stop this guy on offense. <laughs> like, not never. Okay? He's gonna stop us on on offense. It's like the, it's that. He's. He's it's very much the Rudy. Go- That's why the Rudy Gobert yeah. argument is probably the better one. Um, yeah, but you know, we'll see if uh, if Josh Hart finishes fourth in MVP this year. And I can be like, <laughs> well, Joe Kim Noah finished fourth, guys. Like, look at his. In- and what's funny is like Joe uh, Josh Hart is extremely impactful. So I actually, I, I would I think this is going to be my bit now. Is that I'm just going to point to how impactful Josh Hart is and be like, listen, Joe Kim Noah finished fourth in MVP. One season for being impactful on doing the dirty work. Okay. Actually, this was outstanding. And I enjoyed going down memory lane with you. So I believe we only had three years that were changed that James Harden should have won over Giannis. Mm-hmm. That so you did give it to oh, Steph Curry should have won it over Russ. Yes. And what's the other one that I'm missing? Uh let's see. We had Durant right, Curry right, Curry right, Curry wrong. Um, 
Harden. Oh, so it's just two. Just two that changed. Right. Yeah, just two. Yeah, just so two. So Harden should have another and Steph should have another. Yep. All right. And I have LeBron winning another. I think where I've landed is Kawhi should have one. And yeah, Kawhi should have one. LeBron should have another. But I'm like, fine, if you want to give it to Steph. The Durant one is a fascinating case because like you said, 81 games. I remember that season. Durant's whole career is so hard to evaluate because he's just, he's one of the most efficient scorers ever. And because he's made some career decisions to go play in the best situations to, to highlight that efficiency, um, you commend him for it, but also apparently we knock him for it. Like it's so tough to evaluate like a game game for your life. Who do you want on the floor? It's like Steph's there. LeBron's there, Jordan's there, but like, is it insane that I'm taking Durant over Kobe? But like, I understand. I would, I would take Durant over Kobe. But easily. like, I understand there's like an intimidation factor that Kobe had, but I also know that six for 24 in a game seven is on, is in play, you know, whereas yeah. Durant is like a, a, a very close to averaging 50, 40, 90 for his career, mm-hmm. which is why the 2014 season is such a, such a fascinating, like, he, he, Easily, won, he correctly won the award, loses in six at home to the Spurs in the playoffs. And then I think that's when the clock started ticking on how much longer he'll be in OKC. Yeah. And he, yeah. obviously, two years later, he's gone. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I will say, like, based on yeah. the eye test, even just the eye test alone, um, I, I think we can see Durant's play style translate to anywhere. Like, Durant is going to score efficiently literally no matter who his teammates are. It's not yeah. like like you're sending doubles at Durant and it's going to fluster him and he's like like if he gets the ball in an iso position um in the corner and I mean uh you know uh, uh near the free throw line, he is going to be able to score. Like you're not going to stop him. And and I think that we can see Durant's game translate to a variety of situations. Yes, he's played with really great players, but I don't think that they, their greatness is what made him great. And especially in this season, um I don't remember where what what Westbrook did that season in particular, and I'm going to look at it really quickly, but Okay, like Westbrook had a really impactful season, but played 46 games. So. He got hurt, and that's why Durant ended up winning yeah. the award, you know? So, you know, I, I think that that's, to me, that's a very solid MVP award that I don't question from, from Durant. That OKC team won 59 games, and Russ missed almost half of them. So yep. that, I think, is is why he won the award. I just think he get. He's always going to have to live with the fact that, like you said, his game would have translated anywhere. You could have gone anywhere and you went to a 73 win team that eliminated you the year mm-hmm. before. And whether right or wrong, he's just always going to have to live with that, that your two championships, you turned a all time great team into an unstoppable thing <laughs> for two years. And it was because you got hurt and then Clay got hurt. And then Fred Van Vliet got hot is the only reason your team was the throne. Fred Van Vliet, man. Yeah. 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 Um, XJ, this was great. You can hear awesome. us go through the rest of the, the list all the way at, back to 2000 on the Patreon on Saturday morning. Um, but XJ, tell the fine folks where they could find you on the internet. Yeah. Find me at Xavier J Designs on any social media that I'm a part of, um, you know, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, threads uh you know hit me up and uh yeah this was a great conversation jim macy i i just want to say i'm so uh grateful to be on with such a basketball historian like <laughs> yourself and to be able to add all of the context and to kind of have that aspect the narratives the context with the data i think this was like a blast so i i, I love doing it i'm excited to do uh the rest of the seasons to 2000 if you catch us on patreon Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody, as always, for tuning in. If you dig the show, head over to iTunes, drop a five-star rating and a review. Plenty of evergreen content coming your way and not in the not-too-distant future. And until then, thank you for listening. Stay safe out there, and we will speak with you soon. Peace. <laughs>